I will now call the meeting of the Standard Health Fire Commission to order for Wednesday, October, oh, October <laughs> which will be August 14th, 2024. Welcome. Um, I could do a roll call. I'm here. David? Perfect. Again? An echo in the room. Uh, Thomas? Weather. Present. Donna? When is here? here. John? Here. Brian? Here. We are uh, all but one president. We have a forum. We can act as and conduct our business. And that would start with the uh, search for any members of the public who may be joining us. That'd be negative. That would no be members. Indeed. Unless we are interrupted by a call coming in from outer space. Um, the minutes were provided for our meeting of June so long ago. And I assume we have all read them and found them uh, to be accurate. And if not, are there any, were there any omissions, corrections, adjustments that need to be made? Hearing nothing from the table, I will uh, entertain a motion to accept. So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. It has been seconded in favor. <clears throat> Voice vote. All in favor. Aye. Thank you. And they stand as presented. Um, I will stop at a moment in terms of the printed agenda and ask a question, Mr. Wong. Do we have a guest? Yes, we do. And could we deal with a presentation of sorts now or later in the printed agenda? Um, or is I, there one? I think that's up to you, but um, they are. Rodney, are you planning I'm on here for the whole time? time? So whatever so, you need. Okay. I would just uh, follow the agenda then, if, okay. wherever he's on and, the agenda. Then I will. Uh, yeah. But thank you. In that position, hold until later on, and, and we'll hear from you then. Thank you. Um, Fire Foundation. Is there a report from the foundation? No, the foundation, as the commission, is not in, in the month of July. Shut up. Therefore, nothing to report. Yeah. Uh, 150th subcommittee. The um, making sure everybody knows the parade apparatus parade scheduled for everybody is postponed until next year. We just need more time to. Um, there's a there's a lot to it, so we need more time in a in this table until 2025. We have uh, the next opening open house is going to be on August 17th, this coming Saturday, station 52. These are 52 cards, so I'll make sure everybody has them. All trading cards, courtesy of the Fire Foundation. Thank you. Uh, 52's open house, Saturday at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. is the open house portion. And because the facilities has the drill tower, will be a firefighting demonstration of using the North Tower at 1100 hours. So please spread the word to anyone. What about parking there? Parking is limited, though. I just tell people that park at San Rafael High School. That's what it says. It's using part of that field for outside people that use the field for um, soccer on Sunday. There's plenty of parking over there. So just park at San Rafael High School. Um, September 8th is the open house for station 54. Um, tentatively, we have a 9-11 ceremony at station 54 on the day 9-11, consisting of the reading of the names of the 343 fallen FDNY personnel who lost their lives that day. Station 54 is building the permanent 9 11 monument slash memorial. They have a piece of steel from the World Trade Center that they are connected to the place. We're having a ceremony that day. Detailed, I talked to the team about the timing on the start path. So we'll get that in a new flyer to show everybody once we figure out the finer details. 
but it'll be the morning of 9-11, probably, but 0900, we're kind of probably oh. thinking we'll, yeah, we'll finalize that. Um, and also tentative date 12-12. The actual anniversary of the SRFD is 12-14, which is Saturday. So we're thinking at 12, so we're thinking about having an open house pop-up museum at the lobby of the Public Safety Center. So we would ask the event to bring a lot of their members on the to open to the public in conjunction with an open house of station to be one and a rededication of the plaque that was outside of the port station of the old firehouse. So um, that's kind of uh, a thought that we have finalized. But we're kind of doing work around 12, 14 decades. One day prior, and we would invite school groups. Then I found out on 12 13, which is a Friday, you know, a lot of the city offices um, personnel don't work on Friday. They work four hours, four years, Monday through Thursday. So we that it did happen on Thursday. So which date is it tentative rescheduled for the 12th or the 14th? 12 12. Okay. The actual anniversary is the 14th, Understood. but in order to get school groups. And so do we have a time that we're going to do it? Uh, probably from tentatively, we're thinking of it. And so. And now you're up. Any questions? Um, Anyone? Okay. <clears throat> Maybe call us in if we can help in any way. I'm yeah. doing you, will be, this. you will be called. <laughs> we'll, have, we'll be putting up that day. Um, I'm going to uh, to appoint a personal privilege between five and six. Thank you for the okay, between four and five uh, on the agenda. And as we all know, it is not a secret, but to make it official, it's not very often that we're happy to lose a member of the commission. But under the circumstances, um, we are. And we we'll congratulate you, sir, on your appointment. And thank you for your service, all the many years and many organizations within the city. And I uh, wish you very much success. Thank you. You guys are great. A huge influence on what we do and how we do it. And I know over the years have gotten us <clears throat> out of trouble on a couple of occasions. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the legal assistance. Always glad to help. And I'll still help to the extent I can. I'm very limited in what I can do as a judge, what advice I can give. But as a civilian citizen, I'm here to help. If you need me to staff something or anything like that, I'm happy to help. Okay. <clears throat> and then I guess the city's advertising the opening. Yes, the city clerk's office will be uh, handling that. Um, but there will be a recruitment for your position um, that will be posted and as soon as we have that information it's and it's out we'll we'll be sure to forward it to this commission. No, I would hope whoever's an alternate, I don't even know if we have alternates still, mm -hmm. but I would assume you guys would apply. I'd hope you would apply for the position. Still think about it. Well you know, <laughs> I mean last week I heard that you had to reapply every two years. Yeah. So if there's an alternate, you can stay here for this is true. Yeah. That's how I yeah. got yeah. done yeah. 12 years. Yeah. <laughs> that was an alternate for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> right. That is a good point. But thank you, Stan. Yeah. Um item five on the agenda, current media coverage. The San Francisco Chronicle item is this was distributed uh, around the table. And if you have a copy of well, it, pass it to the Um it's the state of California looking at what we've been talking about for a long time. And uh, the uh, county <clears throat> organization, 
Marin Wildfire Prevention Story. They have been touting this concept of vegetation some distance away from the village for quite a while. Now the state of California is looking at it to make it statewide issue. Uh, for those of you who know of individuals in that industry, uh, gardeners and uh, landscape maintenance people and everything, you may want to mention it to them in passing that this is over, coming up over the horizon because it's going to change a lot of how business is conducted. Any questions about this or comments? Maybe one question, Chief. It, are the state standards higher or lower than what we have for the county or city? No, or ours, are they ours are definitely higher. I mean, we're taking, I mean, we basically taking the whole city. We haven't separated the high fire hazard, the, the high fire hazard areas. Our whole city is it. So this definitely, we, our standards are a lot higher. Yeah, I mean, the new state standard will just apply probably in the hillside areas, mm -hmm. the high hazard areas, whereas city standards apply throughout the entire city. Yeah. Uh, reports. Could I uh, jump in? Uh, yeah, on the third. Would we be able to go back and just touch on uh, agenda item three before we proceed into chair and commission reports? Yeah. And this uh, involves our our guest here today, okay. who I'd like to introduce. Yeah. Uh, this is Rodney Masco from Emergency Services Consulting International, or ESCI for short. Mm -hmm. You've been briefed uh, over the past few meetings on our staffing and resource deployment study that is now in process. It's kind of going along with our EMS study, separate, but kind of on going along on, on sure. separate but similar tracks. Uh, Rodney is here to do a two-day site assessment. He is wrapping up his second day. So he's been involved in various activities and meetings both yesterday and today. And we thought this would be perfect for him to attend the fire commission meeting to interact with you all and hopefully just to give a brief overview of the study and what he's doing here over this site assessment two-day period. Absolutely. Please. I don't know. I saw some stations. saw some mountains. Any yeah. questions? <laughs> <laughs> Rodney's from Florida, by the way, but they have no mountains. Uh, come on. I got Mount Trashmore. <laughs> we'll hold that against you. <laughs> uh, just to give you a little bit of my background, I, I uh, just retired in uh, November as the Deputy Chief of Marion County Fire Rescue. Um, in Florida after 33 year career there. Um, about a 1600 square mile service area, 36 stations. We run up nearly 100,000 calls a year. Um, ALS transport, non transport, transport about 50,000 patients a year. Um, annual budgets running in, the, I think we're up to the 165 million or somewhere around in there nowadays. Um, I don't know, we keep spending money. Uh, but uh, so that's kind of my background. Started as a volunteer in 1983. So I've worked kind of up through the through the different ranks and, and seeing a, a county with 26 separate volunteer fire departments eventually becoming a countywide service um, and transitioning to ALS, trans transitioning to transport. Uh, we run a, a or the, the lead agency for a task force, uh, light task force down there. So type two um, task force and uh, regional hazmat and all that. I've uh, been with the SCI since about 2019, um, doing evaluations mainly from the data side because I was working a Monday through Friday job. Um, so mainly doing data analytics. And so with with uh, with this project, um, doing the data analytics as well as actually the the on-site kind of kind of getting a look at things. Um, so I've seen most of the stations, um, been able to tour through them and 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 really see, I think, some great successes. Um, I, I you know, all of the stations that have been remodeled slash rebuilt, um, just some great things. You know, some of the big things that we look at for firefighter safety is separate PPE storage. The new stations all have that. Um, we look for the exercise room to not be in the apparatus space, and all of the new stations have that. Um, from a mental health standpoint, the individual bunk rooms, all of the new stations have that. Um, so definitely seeing uh, seeing some great things there. Um We've already done a lot of the data analytics, so we kind of know where the call volume is. We know where 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 our response times are, our travel times are, um, and so 
kind of moving forward, we'll get back and start compiling some of our GIS models. And, and so some of our thought processes that we're going to work through, uh, we're going to take the existing system and say, let's, let's just pretend there's no fire stations anywhere in the city and ask the computer to tell us where would you put fire stations based on where all the addresses are in the city. Um, so it's called station allocation. So we're going to do that, um, looking at it from the uh, six station model, because I think you guys have six, not counting 58, right? If I remember right. right. So we're going to do it with just, if I had six stations, where it would be, let's not even talk about 58 yet. And then we'll also do that model. Okay, if I had seven stations, what would what would that model look like? And then that'll kind of give us the basis to look and see, okay, well, here's where the stations are. Um, and, and obviously, you know, in the last five years, you guys have pumped a lot of money into building fire stations. So we're not going to say bulldoze down this place down, this one down, because it, it doesn't belong here now. Um, but we'll be able to kind of really get a better look at what are the best delivery models based on what you have. Um, and, and each of those concepts will look at with Marinwood and without Marinwood. Um, so that really gives uh, this group, it gives your, your city council, it gives the fire chief city manager that ability to really look at, here's the facts, you know, here's, here's how far it is. And, and we look at several different measures. We look at uh, ISO, which is Insurance, Insurance Services Organization. Um, they look at a mile and a half travel distance from a fire station. They look at a two and a half mile travel distance from a, a ladder truck. And they look at a five mile travel distance from a fire station. So we'll look at that. And then NFPA, which is the National Fire Protection Association, they look at a four minute travel um, for the first unit to arrive and an eight minute travel for all of the units to arrive. Um, so we'll be able to kind of go through and you'll end up seeing a report um, that'll really present all of the facts of here's the information. Um, we've also looked at some of the impact and already provided some of that to Chief from the proposed Northgate project um, and what that may do to some of the service demand um, within the community. Um, and, and so that's kind of where we're at. We're, we're hoping, my goal is hopefully to have a draft to Chief no later than, than mid-September um, for us to really start flushing out and, and just make sure we didn't miss anything or we didn't capture or hear something wrong. Um, and then hopefully by October, really, I'm hoping to have a final product uh, ready. And what I hope to do is from this and also our EMS report to develop a strategic plan moving forward, which then develops the normal yearly work plan, all lining to what, what I foresee in the future is just um, not becoming a stagnant organization, but a, a becoming an organization that is ready to accept the challenges of increased growth, increased call volume, and all those things that, that go around with that. So being able to do that. And for me, it's really important to be able to articulate it with backed up with data, with the narrative, and with support from everybody. That's why you guys are uh, hugely important to that part of it. And those what I see is the three components of moving the organization forward. I go over there as a <clears throat> car chief and just say, damn it, I want this. But the reality, that doesn't help me in, in any sense of the word. Uh, and it really kind of uh, puts me in a predicament when I'm moving forward to that. So I'd rather not do that and rather have the data, the analytical support, the narrative, and carry all that myself forward and then move forward for the, where I believe the organization needs to go. Just one other brief comment. Uh, the chief has mentioned before that our system gets stressed mainly on the EMS side, almost on a daily basis, usually between like 1 and 4 p.m. or noon and 5 p.m. We don't have enough ambulances to service our, our calls. Um, that's today. I put an updated uh, future projects list in front of you today. This shows you what we're looking at potentially over the next 10 years as far as construction and development, a lot of which, most of which is high density mid-rise and even we're looking at some high-rise now. Uh, so what the chief needs to prepare for is this. How are we gonna meet the service demands that we're facing potentially in the next 10 years when we're challenged now on a daily basis with, with the current city population? So uh, we're just trying to get ahead of this. And like the chief said, we need, we need data. Um, we've mentioned the Northgate Town Square project, which is now moving forward, by the way. It has got legs and it's moving forward. Um, several months ago, we had noted to our, our planning department, this is the largest project, single project, possibly in the history of Marin County in the past 50 years, Northgate Town Square project. This is going to have a significant impact on our resources. So 
we had noted in our preliminary planning reviews that we could potentially need a fire station on that site or additional fire equipment or additional staffing. And during one of the early meetings with the developers, they pretty much blew up at that. And they really pushed back hard. And they said, we need to see data to validate that. And exactly what the chief was just talking about. We can't just say it, we gotta prove it. So that's why Rodney's here, to help us validate the needs going forward. Chief, will it be in time to go back to them and get them to commit to that? No, we've missed the vote on Northgate. And, and, and I don't, like I said, we missed the boat on it, but it, it wasn't intentional and it wasn't uh, like we purposely missed it or we thought we just missed it. We just didn't know there was a time. We had addressed some of the issues that we felt that were concerned about early on. And I have to credit Chief Center for this um, really early on in there. But really, and part of it's just because this is new to the city. It's not just it's not just the fire department, it's new to the city. Uh, so we, we kind of missed the boat, but I really don't blame it on anybody. It just it just happened just because we're not used to this. But I do think that now, knowing what we know now, obviously we have to be proactive and really kind of pursue it. Wherever we see an opportunity to announce something, to say something, to carry a narrative, that's what, or produce data, that's where we need to be. And then, you know, I think both me and Chief Sandy have committed to that and, and right. have aggressively pursued that with multiple other departments in the city. But what you're saying is it's too late to get the developer to chip in to do what we need to do. There's no well, wiggle room at all you know, on that. What we had Rodney do early on was do a special drill down into the Northgate Town Square project. They they fast tracked, just did a kind of a down and dirty study of Northgate Town Square and what's being proposed. And that that report, uh, based on just looking at Northgate Town Square, did not validate uh, a station. And we weren't looking to add another station to the system. What we were looking for was possibly relocating station 56, because although station 56 is a great station, it's poorly positioned strategically. It's at the far west end of its response district. It really should be moved closer towards the freeway. And when we saw Northgate Town Square, we thought, well, this is an ideal opportunity to possibly get it closer to the freeway and more centralized into its response district, and also more strategically located to serve the northeast quadrant of our city that we depend on Maroonwood to serve now. See, we're very dependent on Maroonwood and we, we have a JPA with them, but as JPAs go, that could remain strong or it could start to falter. And if Maroonwood one day said, you know what, we're not gonna serve that area anymore, we would be struggling to be able to meet our res response time standards to get an engine or an ambulance out there in a timely basis. Unfortunately, we closed 30 Joseph Court and sold that property to the county. That was kind of our, our fail safe option. We could have possibly reopened that station if necessary, but it's gone now. So we're kind of in a, between a rock and a hard spot with ensuring 24 seven reliable service to the Northeast quadrant of, of San Rafael. We depend on Marinwood. We're moving forward with, with discussions with them to further strengthen our relationship, which is good. It's all positive. Well, positive. So things are looking good. But um, the other thing we face too, which uh, this is interesting, I've never faced this before. It happened with North, Northgate Town Square. We're actually getting some political pressure and some pressure from city leadership to, hey, fire department, don't possibly derail this project because of fire concerns. This has got to move forward. The city, and it's kind of explained at the top of this. Um, page, cities under pressure to develop, to put in housing. They have to. State mandates. Right? State mandates. Yeah. And and there always have been state mandates, but now for the first time ever, there are penalties mm -hmm. if you don't meet your, your numbers. So we're facing increased demand and challenges and things that I've never dealt with before, to be honest with you. But what you're saying is the state isn't recognizing that the increased housing creates a greater need for safety. They put that on our backs. It's a, it's the classic unfunded mandate. You do it and you figure out how to support it. So. Hmm. In the grand age of data is king. Thank you. Yes. Has, has anyone created the program or a series of programs that 
basically look at all the moving parts of the development in a metropolitan area and and come down to if you add 10 people you need the following eight things if i'll let rodney answer that yeah. I, I wouldn't say necessarily there's a definitive program. I mean, that's obviously what organizations such as ESI look at. Right. And a big part of that and, and, and part of the difficulty in, in really giving a good quantifiable to that is what's the demographic of that. So, so we know call volume is absolutely associated with the people. Where there's more people, there's more calls. Uh, so looking specifically at the Northgate project, we actually projected based on what they're saying they're going to build, the number of units, the number. So we took the number of calls that occur on that property right now today as a commercial property, which is going to be lower because the people don't live there. And then we said, okay, that's what they're running today every year. And so then we projected, okay, with the number of housing units and people we're projecting with, with the developer's proposal, here's what the population is going to be. So if we take the, uh, basically we uh, in the industry, we'll look at the number of incidents per 1,000 people in population. So then we applied that to that. Um, that really, and I don't remember the numbers offhand, I can pull up the computer if you want to know the actual numbers, but I want to say that the low number was about 400 more calls a year and the high number was like 600 more calls a year just based on the number of people. Now, that's just people. Now, if I say now 50% of those people are going to be 65 or older, that's going to increase that call demand because they're a higher utilization service. Or if I say 50% of that's going to be low income housing, they're going to be a high system utilizer because low income tends to use emergency services for their health care. Um, so there's so many factors like that that it's hard to really give a good definitive. Um, but I think uh, just in, in my observation from, from the outside, you know, as a city, San Rafael has not had to deal with growth because it hasn't been occurring. So every city department is scrambling to figure out how do we do this? Um, so a good example in, in my head, just for coming from my county, again, we're 1,600 square miles, about 350,000 population. Um, we have a city um, at the center. We have a couple of smaller cities. What's the city? City of Ocala. We're about an hour and a half north of Disney, if that helps. Well, our Disney, not your all's Disney, but the real Disney. <laughs> <laughs> the better Disney. Um, but uh, so even even as a county, you know, we've gone through a lot of growth and, and we are one of the fastest growing counties in the, in the state, if not in the nation. Um, and, and so up until the last few years, our different county departments really didn't work together on that growth. And that's something that we've changed so that, you know, as that developer is proposing, I want to develop X. Then that then we're going to get the road department involved. We're going to get the fire department involved. We're going to get the sheriff's office involved, mm -hmm. and so all of those players are going to be able to present. Here's here's our impact and our needs, mm -hmm. so that then our elected officials, our county commission, as they're making the decision on those developments, can can hopefully say these are the things that we're going to make you do as a developer if you want to approve them. Now, the other side that, that you may run into, and, and I think just speaking with Chief today, this is part of what we're going to see with Northgate for you. These developers don't have specific deadlines and timelines. So a good example, there's a retirement community there in our county, one of many, um, that their plot for their development was, was, was approved by the board like 50 years ago. And, and I want to say in the end model, it's like 20,000 homes. Well, they've been building for 50 years and they're only about halfway there. So they could turn around tomorrow and say, you know what, we're going to speed up our phase. And, and so that's the other side of it, that there's not a perfect, here's the impact. Mm -hmm. um, so really the key comes down to, for you guys, is all of the city departments, along with the fire department, having that as early on as soon as somebody's proposing a project, that all the city departments that would be impacted by that project Get, sit down at a table together and have those conversations to be able to say, well, hey, we got to build a road. We're going to make the developer build this road based on our traffic impact. Well, okay, while you're building that road, then the fire department utilities are going to be saying, well, hey, we need fire hydrants. We need fire hydrants of X capacity because of, so that's going to change which size mains go underground. Uh, you know, certainly from the wildlife fire, wildfire, you know, urban interface, what, what are the things we need for that? Um, you know, from the medical standpoint, what are the needs? And, and, and you know, 
there's all of these different factors. So, so long answer, but the short answer is they're not a perfect yeah. model because there's so many what ifs. Yeah. Uh, but it really just requires each governing body to sit down and have those conversations and not let those things get fast tracked so quickly that each department doesn't have that opportunity to say, hey, here's the impact. And ultimately, your elected officials are going to make those decisions. They're going to say yay or nay on that on that permit, that zoning, that planning, you know, that that special <laughs> use permit. Um, but hopefully that, that, that we as as the different departments educate them that they're making the best decision for the community, but ultimately they're the ones that, that make those decisions. And one thing I do have to add to that is in my previous gig that I used to have, uh, that department uh, had, we weren't part of any kind of growth on that. We basically just got the buildings and all of a sudden we saw the call volume and saw the big building. Well, now that we do. So we I actually have to say, while well, teams are a little kind of messed up here, we're actually a lot forward, a lot more where, where we think we would be, want to be, than we, than we were in my previous gig. Yeah. Oddly enough, I mean, obviously we we kind of missed the boat on this for whatever reason. But just I don't even know how to say that we missed the boat. I think we just like we were at the dock. The boat never arrived. Yeah, that's what, yeah, it, that's was. what it was. We were there. Yeah. We we're on time early. Yeah, yeah. and well, think, yeah. then we were told we missed the boat. We're like, what do you mean we missed the boat? Yeah, that's a, that's probably a better analogy. So, but I think the I boat think, sank is what yeah. happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think I think now we've been we've made the relationship with Michael, which is the uh, economic development, yeah. uh, community development. Uh, so we've made those contacts now that we're actually part of that process now. So I'm like really kind of proud that we're part of that process. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, when somebody sees it, there's no change in it. But but for me, I feel a lot better that we're actually at the table now having those conversations where everybody, we're talking about, you know, potential in the future of the impact fees, development fees, creating a development district, all that stuff. We're at that conversation part where two years ago or a year ago, we weren't having those conversations. We weren't even at the table. So while I measure my 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 wins in the fact that we're at the table now. So like I said, I could be depressed about it that we missed the boat, but I could also be really happy. Like, no, now we're actually part of that conversation piece of that, which I'm really impressed with our organization that we're at that we're at that phase now. And also at the end of the day, thanks to Rodney and his team, we confirmed that the Northgate Town Square project really didn't validate the need for another fire station there. I mean, obviously, um, if it did, we'd be having an entirely different conversation because early on with the developer, they told us, they said, you go get the data and prove that you need a fire station there. And if we were to come back with the data, we'd be in a much different position, but the data didn't support it, which is fine. We we, we move on. We don't want to require something that doesn't need to be required. So I we, could that we don't want to over so have to show the data that we don't need a station no. there. <laughs> I, I'm confused. How can it not show that we need a station when you're going to have the amount of growth of a population? How is that possible that you're saying it didn't show it needed? Well, when you're only going to increase that call volume by four to six hundred calls a year, that's so even at the worst, six hundred calls, that's less than two calls a day. So none of the stations are at such a busy level that two calls a day really need, means we need another fire station. Now the EMS study might support we need more ambulances. Okay. 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 Or that's what where we all need the to do is we need is. to take our two cross-staffed ambulances. The data might support okay, those now need to be fully staffed because right now we're having a real challenge with, and the chief can talk to this more. A cross-staffed ambulance takes whoops takes an engine out of service, right? And that really has a significant significant impact to our operation, especially if you think about it. One of our cross-staffed ambulances is at Station Fifty Five, way out by Peacock. So when they jump in the ambulance and take off, that engine's out of service. And it takes a long time to get a fire engine out to Peacock from downtown. Okay, so that the EMS study might support that we fully staff our ambulances so that we don't have the cross-staff burden or that we bring on an extra, an additional ambulance during the peak period, right. something like that. So it doesn't warrant a fire station, but, gotcha. And I think you'll see some of our data is going to coincide with with a lot of what the EMS study showed along those lines, where there's there's potential needs for infilling for services, but not so much of we need a new station built. Okay. Yeah. Is this is the city realistic about the data they provide in places that are high density economically challenged? For instance, the canal is. We know there's a lot of people that. Are living there that doesn't reflect the census data? Do they? Is the city pretty good about 
providing you that information? So for us, for population, we, we do use census data, but we use what's called the American Community Survey. So American Community Survey numbers are generally higher than the actual census data. It is out of the Census Bureau. Um, they actually tie in data that's coming from your different organizations that are tracking tracking the homeless mm -hmm. um, and other su such populations and you know, transit housing and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think we've got a pretty good. I think we've got a pretty good mix on that. Yeah. Uh, one of the other powerful tools um, that's in the in the ArcGIS world is called Community Analyst, um, and that's something that we were we were showing um, chiefs and 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 the city GIS team. Um, it actually enables you to to basically draw a line about of any any section you want to draw. You could draw around a city block, you can draw it around a subdivision, whatever, and it'll give you tons of demographic information from insurance coverage to languages spoken to age to uh, education, what their what the average um, home cost is, what the average wage is. I mean, there's a lot of very powerful data out there now in this in this geographical information system world, um, and and the city has those tools, um, and I think again because they haven't had to deal with growth, they haven't had the opportunity to explore those tools. Um, so I think part of what we've already seen from this is is the fire department absolutely I think has seen the value of those tools, but uh, two of the city GIS people met with us yesterday, and I think they are seeing. Um, where it's going to benefit not just the fire department, but the other agencies that are part of the city and being able to to, to really provide the services to the, to the residents and visitors. And as we looked at the data yesterday, we do we did do the hexagons mm -hmm. on, on the, the, the density in there. And it did prove to be like some of the areas down the canal, we're looking at 13,000 square miles. That was, it's square, square miles, square, I guess it's square. The acres. hexagons were 50 acres. 50 acres, 50 acres. So that's pretty 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 high density that's, that we, yeah. that's in there. So and it was actually reflected on there. So it was 50, 50 acre little circles around the whole thing that showed exactly and going out that that makes sense that makes there. Sense, yeah. Totally makes sense there. So yeah, and you so I, I in the report you'll end up seeing like here will be a population density map where darker where there's more people, and then you'll see the incident okay. densities where guess where the calls are darker where there's more people. So that you know it, it definitely ties together where the people are and where the calls are. Raji also mentioned age. That is a significant factor. Uh, what we're seeing in San Rafael is a significant uptick in the numbers of skilled nursing facilities and retirement type uh, residential facilities that are coming into San Rafael. And now what we're seeing too is we're seeing uh, mid-rise buildings that were originally proposed to be mixed use, retail on the first floor, apartments, uh, floors two through eight, they're rolling that into retirement type communities, skilled nursing, because they're more profitable. And those facilities, some of them we go to on a daily basis or sometimes two or three times a day to transport the residents to our local hospital. So the, the, the age and the facility type or occupancy type has a significant factor on our call volume. How can we help? I, I know you mentioned there's the other report um, that will be married with this. Um, what can we do kind of as that interface with the communities? And... So there's, you know, and then I always say the support and, and still trying to figure that, for that part out. We haven't gone to council for any requests or anything like that because I'm not prepared to do that. Like for me, I need to have sound information on there. So certainly when I go to council or I go to city media manager's office and stuff like that, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna ask for you to support it in the fact by going out there yeah. and supporting that, you know, when when people say, yeah, us as citizens or commission support the fire chief in his request, that that is certainly is a lot more helpful than me just going up there and doing this type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So once again, I say the data to support it. My folks, the commission, just general folks that have been able to support those things on there. Those things mean a lot. That's that's how we build our project. And uh, you know, I never blame somebody for saying no to me. I just I just failed to articulate the idea like I felt about it. So like for, for me, if somebody tells me I'm all right with the no, that just means I got to do even better next time because then do a little, much better job at it. So and I'm fine with that. I mean, that's that's my job as fire chief. That's what I have to do. I mean, I don't get to fight fire anymore. So that's what I get to do now. Other <laughs> fires. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we can certainly, John, and I can. Um provide that yeah. testimony about 55 and being out in that part yeah. 
of the city and what a threat that would provide if we're pulling an engine yeah. to you know, supplement that again elsewhere. And once again, and, and, and I just need to reinforce this. While I give you a lot of this information, we're still functioning like, like we're highly effective how we function Absolutely. right now. Um, and so it's not negative. It's just that how can we do better? And that's what I kind of say, how can we do better? I base my things on three theories, right? I need to provide a positive, productive, and healthy work environment to everybody. And if those, that's what I, that's where I hang my, hang everything on 100% on. If I'm providing those three elements of the, to my organization, then I'm doing pretty good in there. The rest is all stuff. If it's negative, I need to, I need to make sure it's falls in one of these three. Is it going to make me more productive, more healthy? Uh, then, then I'm going to engage for sure. Any other questions or comments? Thank, Thank you. you. This was great. Super. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just ask: Are there any comments or information that you guys, as the commission, would like us to consider as we're looking at this station information? Is there a significant daytime versus nighttime population? Is there a big difference? Yes. Um. And and we'll that report. I don't remember what the daytime population is, but we'll we'll actually run that, and in there we'll talk about daytime versus nighttime. So yes, absolutely, especially as a city. You have more of the businesses and industrial of the community from within the county. And obviously, driving 101, there's a bunch of people driving to San Rafael. There's obviously some driving all the way down to San Francisco. Uh, but yeah, there is absolutely, a, a, and I want to say it's almost a 20,000 person oh. growth um, during the daytime hours. Um, and as well, the other, you know, in, in you're going to see a chart in there that's based on time and looking at the hour of the day of calls, you know. You're a community that's very similar to most communities in the United States where you don't have third shift manufacturing or third shift warehousing. So that means in the early hours, so from about 11 o'clock till about four o'clock in the morning, ain't a whole lot going on. And then as people get through their day, it starts getting busier. And then throughout the afternoon is the busiest part of the day, which kind of covers what Chief's talked about, kind of that 10 to 2 time frame. And then as people start going home, those that call volume kind of drops down. Um, until they all get back home and now they're resting at home and not calling 911 anymore as much. Um, so yeah, absolutely. There, there's a huge shift of population. Um, you know, one thing I, I will say that it's kind of an advantage uh, that, that your organization has already taken advantage of is the local option sales tax. You know, that was one of the things we did in our county. Our commissioners were able to get the voters to approve it and sell food on because if you stop and think about it, so if I got 20,000 people coming into the city of San Rafael that don't live here, they're not paying your property taxes. They're not paying for the services that the fire department is giving them. So through that use of they're buying stuff here, they're buying lunch, they're buying gas, they're, things like that, they're contributing to a service that emergency services is providing. So that's one of the nice things when you do have a big shift of population like that is, is that ability to shift some of that tax burden of funding services, not just to the residents. And is that ta sales tax is that going to the county or, or to the city or is it a combination of both? Uh, our sales tax is split up, so a lot of it, most of it, actually goes to the state. Uh, uh, but some of it comes like uh, Measure E for essential facilities is three quarter cent tax that comes directly to the city, as well as Measure R, which passed during COVID, as another quarter cent. So um, on top of that, I believe one percent previously that by state mandate kind of comes to us already. So that 1% though goes to the city's general fund and then comes to each department, including the fire department, but there's SMART and there's other uh, transportation regional taxes. So that all makes up the nine and a quarter we pay here. Yeah. But only a small portion of it actually comes to- Yeah, yeah, your, your main sales tax obviously is funding state operations, but but having that like in Florida, the state gets 6% and then we have, we put on a one cent local option sales tax where that comes. And so for us, our commissioners segregated that money to roads. I want to say 60% of it, 60% of it goes to roads and then the rest of it goes to emergency services, uh, sheriff's office, fire department, and how they wiggle this one in the animal center. But... <laughs> They're busy in that. <laughs> yeah, we are close enough to Disney for that again. They didn't talk about the villages at all. I try not to talk about the villages any more than I have to. It's, it's an interesting place. <laughs> Part of the villages is in Marion County, if you've ever heard of the villages. Yes. That's where people <laughs> kill each other with golf carts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they with what? Golf carts. Golf carts. Golf carts. <laughs> I literally, there's, I, I saw on my Facebook yesterday, there was a, a fatality for a pedestrian versus golf cart. 
Cool. They soup these things up. They will the <laughs> retired firemen will be down there. It will look like a fire truck. It will that thing will do 45 miles an hour. <laughs> and they will take up all the parking spaces at the grocery store with their off carts. If you if you're not familiar with it, Google it. Like, yeah, it's amazing. amazing. What it, it spans over five counties? Three counties. So yeah, yeah it's a community development district. So it's like a city, but it's not a city. Uh, but they get, you know, their funding is their funding. Um, and yeah. Um, up What's until the population, about, Rodney? Oh gosh, I don't even know. It's got it's got to be a lot. Um, it's one of the it's one of the few places that uh, we will see Trump over the next year well, there at least twice. Oh, and or Vance. Um, I mean, it is it is just heavy contra Republican, and there's a lot of money there. Um, and so, you know, when he ran before, he was he was there a lot. Hope so didn't it, doesn't get nicked by a golf ball. It's just called the Village. It's just called the Villages. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a it's a regional development district. You don't know. About uh, the they're not actually oh. part. They're not actually part of Disney. Is they're nowhere near. Disney. Oh, I see nowhere. They're about an hour away from Disney. Okay. There are YouTube um, videos on it. You have to check it out. You okay. won't believe it. Um, yeah, if you ever heard of HOA nightmares, that that's the yes. epitome of HOA nightmares. All right, well, thank you. I definitely I appreciate you guys taking the time and let me, you know, and certainly if you think of anything that you'd like us to consider for that to achieve for Thomas and um, he can get that to us. But uh, it's definitely been, I think, good. And, and just to reiterate what Chief said. Just looking at the data, I, you guys are doing a fabulous job. This fire department is doing a fabulous job. Um, you know, there, there's going to be areas where we're like, okay, well, you're not meeting the NFPA standard. Well, some of the NFPA standards aren't realistic. Um, and, and so there'll be some discussion there of, of developing perhaps some some of your own standards to meet that uh, or, or where your standards need to be. You know, I, I look at my county, 1,600 square miles, and being able to get the first truck there within four minutes is idiotic. Um, because a lot of my half of my county is rural, and, and so it, it doesn't make sense to have a fire station every mile and a half. When the, the you know I've got one rural fire station that if they may have four days that month that they didn't run any calls, like why would I put another station out there? You know, just to meet the four minutes. So, but but again, I I think overall, um, you know, the dispatch center is doing a great job. I think the fire department is doing a great job, and uh, I think we're going to see that. Well, Chief, that's all true, which I'm sure it is. Does that mean we keep our top tier rating at the fire department? Do you want to answer that, Chief? Can you review? Or can you? Sure. Review? So why why are we in danger of losing our our class one? Thank you. Status? I didn't know how to say it, but I knew we were top cabin. And listening to what he shared today, it seems like we should remain top cabin. Is that valid? Uh, I would have to say. That during our 2015 assessment, I believe there were some calculation errors. And I think that happened to many agencies where this particular ISO representative was working. And jumping from a class three, which we were, and prior we had been a class four. Brian? No, I don't think we were in class four. I believe you improved to a class three back in, yeah. in the late 90s, early 2000s. To go from a class three to a class one without making any significant improvements to your operation is almost unheard of. And what happened immediately after a, a lot of agencies in Marin and Sonoma were, were bumped forward, improved their, their, their scores, their classifications without doing anything. And so many agency representatives were, were shocked what's going on here. And what happened very soon after that ISO representative retired, yeah. and then many agencies were contacted very soon thereafter saying, we're going to recalculate your score. And many of the agencies that, that, were, that saw improved scores, those got reversed. And we were, we did not get included in that first go around, but then we got included about two years later. Or they wanted to reassess us. Um, it's an excellent fire agency, but if you talk to agencies that have gone through this process and have achieved class one, they dedicate personnel for two to three years that focus nothing on making the improvements that need to be made in order to meet the scores to achieve a class one status. 
very few ever make it. So in my opinion, if you're anywhere within a class one to three, you're fine. It doesn't impact. If we go from a one to a two or even a one to a three, for that matter, it does not impact anybody's insurance. If Ken was here, he could probably attest to that. So what are we now, right now? We're a one. And how often do we get reviewed? Well, once you're a one, you get reviewed on a more frequent basis. I believe it's, is it one every three years? They normally do once every five years. So yeah, the ones they may drop down to the three yeah. or, or, or if they last, get it worth their last one done. Well, so 2015, 2018, and then they came back to us and 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 wanted to basically revalidate us. I can't remember the, the, the term, Thomas, that they used. But anyway, the, we went through a process where we had to um, basically confirm what we had done in order to get our, our current score. And then from that, they gave us a list of things we needed to do in order to, to maintain it. And so we worked as hard as we could to meet everything on their list. And to be honest with you, we haven't heard back yet. Correct. So, and a lot of things we don't, well, I mean, it has to be like hydrant, loca number of hydrants and hydrant locations and station locations. And there are some things that we really don't, can't control really. Um, right. So. Right. My, my, so the jury's out. We don't know yet. We're still a class one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, and we and you've tried to check to try to get a follow up on. Yeah, that. it's interacting with the ISO has been very challenging. It's very bureaucratic. People turn over, and there doesn't seem to be any institutional memory as they move along. In fact, I remember a few years ago saying, "May I get a copy of our previous report?" And the response was, "We don't keep those." I'm like, "What do you mean you don't keep them? <laughs> what do you mean you don't keep them?" I mean, it was absurd. <laughs> I said, and asking, we were hoping you would send it to us. <laughs> so they also, okay. they also, it's, it's, <clears throat> I've been through it a couple times, but it's a cookie cutter kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you may be providing high level of service, but if it doesn't fit Got the ISO thing, format, yeah, yeah. Right. good point, you know. So, yeah, that's so, a very good point. Good point. Yeah. That happened to us. We're providing. Now, I remember, uh, so I did Berkeley's. And I and Albany sitting right next to us, like literally. Uh, and then we got like we got like and it was this was a while ago. We got not really good scores. And then Albany, I looked at Albany's. I go, how did you guys get scored like really high on training? You guys didn't have training grounds and everything. He goes, oh no, we used yours. Uh, and I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like, like I I don't I didn't get credit for mine, and but he got credit for 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 my. Uh, drill grounds in there. <laughs> so it was it, it, it was like really comical like going like holy cow this doesn't make sense at all so i did i did get very aggressive on the next go around got really aggressive i literally sat next to the person and said all right what is it that, that you want he said like like i want to know kind of stuff because at the time i was a training chief so i go i really want to know what we need to do and a lot of the deficiencies in training and what do we need to do and then we were able to figure that out and burke has got a class one also but i can tell you right now they're not a class one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but they but that's the, they the, got it they got it but they had they got the same letter that mm -hmm. that when I as I was leaving the same letter that that we got here I go oh yeah you guys are gonna have to yeah. deal with this good luck <laughs> but then I come here the same thing <laughs> so, mm -hmm. but yeah so all the favor and the conviction for the department of the standard Hill will be Carol class one raise your hand <laughs> <laughs> okay it's there there you got it <laughs> um thank you very much for the presentation. And let's do a quick run through uh, Commissioner's report, David. Um, just maybe more of a question for Thomas. Do we know is, is there a replacement for <clears throat> her name was Fal Fal Yeah, uh, there has not been yet. Uh, probably need Chief Roman actually could probably speak more to that position. Okay. But we're, we're I think we're reevaluating that position to see how we can better serve not only MWP vegetation welfare but also prevention and operations. So. Um, we're working with HR to kind of try to reimagine that position a little bit um, to, to more of a PIO kind of um, role for the okay. department. Yeah, the only reason I asked is just social media, right? Um, right, we'd, right. We'd love to get right. things going there. And in the interim, should I work through you? or You through? can work with uh, either of us. It, we joke about in the office. Each person in our office is assigned like one social media account. So I'm next door and Quinn is, you know, it's, Instagram and you're looking at Twitter here and okay. <laughs> so send it to me and, and I can route it out and 
Um, we do coordinate our messages though. So when we send something, we try to make sure we hit all of them. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. I don't right. And thank work. you for working. No, but, no, no. but it is something we need to do. Like, like the, I would have told you five years ago, uh, social media, whatever. But now it is completely, we have to take control of that. We have to charge the narrative yeah. on that. We are in charge of the narrative. Like right now, I have to give it to anybody else but myself because they're the ones that carry social media on there. So it becomes a really dangerous, it becomes, as an organization, we become really vulnerable to for them to create the narrative on our behalf. And they yeah. can't do that. Like for me, it's really important. I need to take control of the social media with by having somebody full-time, I say full-time, but basically addressing those those social media issues full-time yeah. and carrying the narrative on our behalf, for sure. Well, feel free to use me to help in a, in a consultative basis, because I'm, I'm happy to do that as, as we've done in the past. But yeah, I think the control has to be done by an employee yes. in the department. Yes. Right. Right. That's great. But also, yeah, there's so many things that we can do to educate, especially this conversation that we had today. Yeah. Like that's something yeah. the community should know about. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's where we run into problems, right? We don't, we, I can't, I can't go to every resident and every community member and tell them all this, all the great stuff we're doing. They just see the fire engine and when fire engine shows up or doesn't show up, that's where the problem is, right? Yeah. But it'd be great to be able to get that, communicate those things, especially those folks, those things that I cannot articulate in through a, you know, there's a lot of stuff I can't articulate in written format during an email, but mm -hmm. certainly through social media, a lot of that stuff I can create narrative around that and send it out with a couple of phrases and not that much work. Yeah. Other than setting up the, the, the format for it. Okay. Well, pull me in as needed. I'm happy to help in any okay. way. Great. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor. I kind of <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all again. <laughs> Our pleasure all these years. Uh, Donna. A couple little things. Um, Chief, I know you're thinking about doing a memorial park out at the Loch Lomond Firehouse. And one of the members of the fire commission shared with me, um, Jeff Kramer, to be exact, that Mount Tamalpais Cemetery has benches that we can order. So I thought I'd give them oh. to Thomas, um, and then we can have it engraved with whatever it is that you wish to have on the bench. And Thomas, can, we, can I take that actually from her and then give it to, because I have uh, Esty and, and uh, Chief Hamilton signed to that project. This is going at a fire station or the park? In the park, Memorial Park. The Memorial Park. Okay. And yeah. But I can, yeah, we'll work with you because the, uh, is this through the recreation department just set up a program to do benches in memorials like this? Oh, no, Cement Parks just started that up um, and they've had a lot of interest so far. So we should just work through their already set up established program now. So we can put, I, I can start rolling the ball and put your touch with them. Actually, well, let, not me. No, let me, let me, let me, okay. and then let's, let me handle that part of okay. it with the, but I'll take this from you. Sure, sure. Okay. We have a process now and it's, it, it can be done. So. And who's handling it? What the That's going to be Craig Barame. He's the assistant director of library recreation. So, so recreation, the city. Yeah, the city, the recreation administers all of our city parks. Beautiful. So, uh, yeah. Good. Have for that. And, Thank you. And I'm just not, I'm not prepared to say that they're going to hand that over to them. I think we want to carry the fire department wants to carry that. Uh, the, so well, that would just came from the foundation, so I perfect. thought I should share it. Yeah, no, well, this is perfect because this is stuff that we're looking at. Because right now we have, I have a concept in my head and have given a couple of pictures to both Chief uh, Hamilton and Esty um, to see what they think of and go from there. So the, the idea is to have a quiet area at Station Fifty Five because it really lends itself to have a memorial out there. And what I want to do, be able to do, is memorialize the previous San Rafael firefighters that have died, either in the line of duty or anything like that. And then once a year, go out there and acknowledge that 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 that, that bravery that they fought, uh, that caused the line of duty death at that point. I would take that back. If it's that fire station, then that's totally us. So we'll push that. But if anyone wants a plaque or a bench at a city park. Um, that would be for recreation. So if we're going to be doing this on Sarah Fire Department property, then we'll just take those, we'll take those out on that and we'll take those that one. The other thing that uh, feedback from the trenches is we would really like to see a glass case in the lobby of this building or two for the fire department that only police has it and that's not right. We should have our own case and things like these could go in the case. So I don't know where you go with that information, but it's, I'm hearing it from the troops and I 
totally agree that we should have representation in the lobby as well. And there's certainly room for two more cases. And I had that discussion with uh, with uh, Thank you, Thomas. Steve, yeah, yeah. Steve, and others, or basically, right. we all agree. It's a question of how can we secure it. What do you mean by secure it? Well, if we have those cases, someone could break into it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It is in the lobby of the cops, but it's like, <laughs> you know, what do we? We've talked about this, and I think that. Um, yeah, they were planned, but it's like and, 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 kind of yeah, and our like I know that stuff that they put on there, the police put in there. I, I actually I'm not like really so really impressed with it okay. because it's stuff from the '80s and stuff like yeah, that, right? Yeah. And we have like really like, old cool stuff. stuff. We <laughs> really got some really yeah. old stuff that's really like we don't want to lose that stuff uh, at all. Yeah. Uh, so like so, like and I, I but so I'm having a battle, but we can get some fairly. Uh, people in the in, 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 in the lobby in the lobby there they're every gonna be day. every day then they're they're gonna be arrested and all that stuff but like I'd rather not even deal with that so but I think that there's probably something that we could do that that we could identify that this makes sense to put in there and not the high value stuff and which not high dollar value to anybody else but it, it has a lot of sentinel value to us so kind of figure figure out what the balance is for that I, I don't know but, but we need to like like the, the original idea was that right that we we're gonna have something out there mm -hmm. Well, we also talked about putting like antique equipment up there, like our hose pump or a hand cart or something like that. Um, but um, there really isn't the, the space to accommodate anything like that. You know, we do have our artifacts. We've got the spiral staircase. We've got the garage doors and a few other things. But um, yeah, we did talk about well, even adorning the, the case, lobby. It was promotional material for the foundation. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, just. Yeah. You know, uh, so on the on the police side, did they they obviously bought the this place? Do you yeah. know how much that cost? No. Maybe we should just need to buy one and then just just put stuff in there. Sure. I mean, I think I can ask where they got it. Yeah. Then we just, but I did think that one of the things that was as uh, as I requested assistance in developing that memorial out there. One of the suggestions that they said, hey, why don't we just put a public safety building on the front and memorial on the front. I go, I go, that's, I go, that's a good idea, but like really like a lot of it, a lot of people associate the police department to this building and the fire station is just on the side of it. I'd rather have just space for fire department somewhere like, and it's like totally quiet. Oh, uh, it's beautiful out there. And it is absolutely beautiful. Like you go out there in the afternoon, like it'd be, it's like a peaceful spot. Like, like I would enjoy going out there uh, and just having my lunch out there as I'm, and I, you know, and, and you know, I didn't know these folks, but you did. And so some of those folks that have passed, but but you know, to me, I'm going to reflect on on what they did for the fire service in the city of San Rafael. No matter what I do, I've never made these folks, but I'm going to reflect that for a little bit there and pay homage to them by me having lunch out there with them. So uh, uh, an area like that, it, it, it's it, I think it means there's significance in what it means to the firefighter out there to just have that spot out there of just be able to reflect them. And is it if uh, 55 adjacent to where the station is, where they had the, the temporary housing? Correct. Is that's where, that's yeah, where my idea Almost like a park. Yeah. Off yeah. To, I mean, if you space. look at, you know, from Point San Pedro, off to the left, there's almost like a park yeah. there. And that's where the chief is referencing. And once again, this is just my goofy thought. Like, look, look, I, have, I don't have any funding for it. I have an idea in my head, and I, I know it makes me feel good. To have a spot like that, yeah. so that's why I'm following through with it. Uh, like I said, I don't have any funding on like that, so we're gonna we're gonna have to find funding for it and all that kind of stuff. But I just want to spread that idea out there to just pay homage to our folks that we lost over the years and just have a, a quiet spot to be able to reflect that. And hopefully, I'm hoping that once a year we'll have some kind of uh, acknowledgement that we just go out there that we just know that whatever it is on 9/11 yeah. or some other date yeah. that we just go out there and we can pay homage to the folks that we lost over the years. Yeah, great idea. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, John, uh, while that season's coming up, I did just a one sheet for you to read. Kind of, it has buzzwords mm -hmm. like new toy, deployment, strike team, strike team leader, which is type one and type three engine, type six engine. Words that might come up. This is a type three engine. So you just kind of read it on your own. Um, the buzzwords will come up. So that um, when you hear them, you'll know. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. Right. Um, no, sir. 
uh, Chief, um, now that you are officially Chief mm -hmm. for the first meeting of this organization. And I'll, oh, pass, right. I'll pass the report over to <laughs> you, Senator. Thank you, Chief. Um, this uh, this month's report is kind of long because we're covering two months of of uh, activity, and I don't I don't want to spend a lot of time with it. You have the opportunity to read it on your own. I'll just uh, note on a couple of high points on page one. Uh, I really want to credit the uh, the San Rafael Fire Association uh, for uh, developing and awarding the annual Paul Crimmins Memorial Scholarship. As you know, Paul Crimmins was a battalion chief here in our department. He uh, died of job-related cancer. He was just, uh, he was an amazing guy. And uh, I, I'm just really impressed with uh, the fact that the association, the Firefighters Association does this. And if you read the narrative, um, you can see that they spent a great deal of time awarding this deciding you know, who really deserved the award. And both of these recipients have, have had um, um, hardships and challenges. So I just can't say enough about that. I think it's just so impressive. And I, I really wanna just credit the, the Firefighters Association on that. Uh, jumping over to page two, at the top of the page, um, the Defensible Space Team under Quinn Gardner and Kate Anderson's leadership they staffed a uh, a booth at the fair, and that's a heavy lift because you have to staff that booth for the entire period of the fair um, from opening to closing, and the fair is five days this year. And so they had team uh, members out there for five days, you know, over the course of a long weekend where most people want to take it off and, you know, enjoy themselves, right? They were out there working the fair. They did a really good job. They had a very impressive booth set up. And I can't say enough about them. I really want to credit them on that. Uh, we had, we've had we had a significant amount of fire activity over the past couple of months. At the bottom of page two and the top of page three, uh, vegetation fire, which was started by this homemade mortar device, which I have a picture of at the top of page three. This device was about this tall. This was a, this was a significant piece of equipment. It was left behind by our, our arsonists and started a vegetation fire uh, out by uh, by Target. Uh, fortunately, it didn't do any damage, but um, we also had a fire out of China camp due to uh, carelessness, uh, use of a barbecue. Uh, over on page four, unfortunately, we lost a, a home at Contempo Marin. This is a manufactured home. When those things start on fire, they usually go very quickly, unfortunately, just due to the construction materials that are used. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, uh, everybody got out safely. There were no injuries. Chief, just one yes. question. Are we seeing an increase in arson-related activity? Uh, it just seems that way from what I've observed. And I saw, you know, the, the one about the guy at Target, remember, where he almost blew his head off in, right. in the, in the yeah. um, garbage where yeah. he had set yeah. that yeah. incendiary yeah. device. But, I don't know, it I seems like there's an uptick right now. A lot in the yeah, past. we just made an arrest uh, yesterday uh, of an arsonist. It's the gentleman who set the fire in Marinwood, the large fire that burned most of the day yesterday. But, so they uh, caught him. Yeah. Was he on site when the fire started? Yes. Yeah. They actually wow. admitted to starting a fire to our crews as they were hiking in. There. Uh, and How in old an individual? Kind of sort of. Thirty forties. Somewhere around there. Not real old. Mm -hmm. Admitted but, to deliberately starting it. They admitted to starting. We didn't know the, the 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 crews that were actually hiking to the fire were hiking and more worried about putting fire out mm -hmm. than having into it. So they they got some little bit of information passing on from these fire. I think by noon they had them arrested. They got them down at the Hamilton uh, Safeway. I think a lot of the fires too over the past couple of months have been fireworks related. Are they arson fires? No, they're 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 carelessness. It's obviously unlawful. Uh, were they trying to like burn down a building in many cases? No, they were just out shooting off fireworks. That's what they were doing. So a little bit of a difference, a <clears throat> little bit of it, both unlawful, obviously. Uh, on July 19th, we had another fire, a vegetation fire. Uh, there's a photo at the top of page five uh, by Thomas Wong. Uh, that was by 4000 Civic Center Drive. Uh, fortunately, no damage to structures. Um, started, it looked like in an area where people gather, uh, possibly juveniles. There was no homeless encampment, but possibly mm -hmm. where people gather uh, to socialize, for lack of a better term. Um, on 
Very notable now, on July 22nd, we had a fire on the 100 block of Oakmont Avenue. This was a mid-afternoon fire, a working structure fire. Um, we had some assistance. I want to pass around these pictures. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Commissioner uh, Lieutenant <laughs> Chung was uh, was riding along that day and was, was engaged in assisting. Uh, Rest in the service. <laughs> what what engine were you on, Commissioner? What's that? What engine were you on? I was on uh, I was on the fifty uh, one with Berkey. So first in. Yeah. First right. in. Uh, this fire was started yeah. by a defective automotive part. The uh, resident of the home had uh, been concerned about this part. Had read about this part that it could possibly cause fires in his uh, vintage. Probably isn't the right term. I think it was a. I'm trying to remember now, it was a 1980s model vehicle. Uh, he had taken it to his mechanic that day, said he wanted that part replaced. Mechanic said, doesn't need to be replaced. He drove home, he got out of his car. He smelled some smoke, but didn't think about it. Went in the house, car caught on fire, caught the, the vehicle next to his on fire in the garage, and then pretty much wrecked the house. He was able to get out with his wow. wife, um, but the house was... You know, it didn't burn to the ground, but it's wrecked. It's dangerous fire. Below grade fire is bad. Yeah. Dangerous. Yeah. Right. So, below grade so, the, so the entryway is actually on the top, and then it goes uh, like, like, like shift work fire. Okay, so any points on that fire? To the point at what your low water volume? I'll make a point about yeah. that fire. <laughs> it was 200 yards from my house. Oh, oh. oh. yes. Want to think it got our attention? <laughs> 14 units wow. on a space not as big as a football field. Including truck 54. Yes. And what it did was ignited in me, no pun intended, <laughs> the need to get the citizenry on that hill to buy in to the parking restrictions because <clears throat> it's it's a it's a two lane road with no parking so basically when there's parking it's a one lane road and if you're trying to get in there with a massive amount of equipment <laughs> something's got to go wrong and. I'll leave it at that. So uh, I am right now discussing this issue with the Homeowners Association and uh, yeah, trying to make the point. Great, I have one. Well, so. Thank you. Yeah. Well, no, I was helping them change SCBA models. Yeah, but you dressed out like a firefighter. How did you manage that? I dressed out. Oh, you I, I bring all that stuff with my trial in case we get a fire. Huh? <laughs> He's prepared. I will say that SRFD is very good at thinking things like. A lot of challenges at that fire. Mm -hmm. A lot of challenges. They did a great job. That was cool. Yeah. Okay. And we're constantly like in there. We 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 constantly run in a deficit. We don't have a whole lot of manpower on. So the you business. were happy to have him. Oh yeah, no, very <laughs> much so. He, when I arrived on scene, he was he was pulling hose. Yeah, because there was supply. There was water supply challenge. Covered to do that. Who cares? I mean, at that point, like you know, yeah. you get hurt. Do you have insurance? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take you to the hospital. <laughs> you might actually make money on it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going inside. <laughs> yeah. No, we're, we would we would we wouldn't put him in a situation no, where it's going to be dangerous. But I was a pump operator, yeah. engineer. That was my thing. Yeah. So it's like, and, but we definitely yeah. appreciate the help. Though. Yeah. I mean, like he's going to be going to ride along on a regular basis. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That was my. I've been on. Yeah. He does. Ride yeah. He does a fair amount oh, yeah. of ride along. Yeah. 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 And just like it's open to everybody else. Oh, like, good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Mine are all white. Yeah, right. okay. we, don't, we don't discriminate whatever you want. Top of page six is some response data for June and July. Uh, uh, bottom of page seven, uh, there's there's several staffing announcements on six and seven, but notable at the bottom of page seven, we have a new battalion chief, uh, Anthony Alviso, who was promoted from captain. He started August 1st. And new fire captain, uh, Jeff and Dea, uh started uh, recently as well. 
And let's see here, last page, page nine, just uh, on a light note, some activity, our fire explorer program is really positive and successful. And I'm very proud of our organization. What we've been challenged with is the fact that we are hiring new firefighters who live nowhere near San Rafael. They come here, they get a job, they work here for two years, and then they get a job closer to home. And what we've struggled with over the past decade is how do we attract local talent? And this is how you do it right here with the Explore program and our cadet program, which are both very successful. And I want to credit the chief for supporting these programs and fostering them and our staff for basically really, really moving them along. So we've got some good interested people who want to be firefighters and they live locally. So they're going to be just, able to afford to stay living locally. That's, that's a different story. That's yeah, different story. that's the problem. Yeah. yeah, But you can only do what you can do, you know? And what we have to do is tap the local community. And then uh, I, what I did was I added on to the report. Uh, I had failed my fault to get uh, a report from our training division, Captain Ryan Goodwin, who does such an excellent job uh, in his role. Um, and he just wanted to give a brief report as well. So I attached that. So, um, and that concludes the report. I have a question, Chief. Um, July 4th, there was a fire up the end of C Street. Pardon me? July 4th, there was a fire up the end of C Street. July 4th, there was a fire. Oh, the July 4th Street. fire yeah. up on Martins? Yeah. Yes, that is noted here. Uh, did I gloss over it? It's, I was probably so excited to talk about Commissioner Chung that I glossed mm -hmm. over it, but I think it's I think it is in here. Um find it here real quickly. Yeah, 60, 64 Martins. It's the middle of page four. Uh very challenging fire. We have not received the fire investigation report back yet on that. Um they the fire fire investigation team was very challenged. They didn't think they were going to come up with a definitive uh, cause and origin. They were able to identify the probable location of where the fire started. Uh, but uh, looking at uh, either fireworks that were going off at the time, a transformer that blew, or, and I'll tell you, this is how a lot of fires, residential fires start, Oily rags, mm -hmm. improperly disposed of in the garage of the house, I believe at 60 Martins, they had been doing some uh, staining earlier that day, and the whereabouts of those rags and what exactly happened to them is, is a mystery, uh, but it's I, I would probably lean towards that, to be honest yeah. with you, because the fire started in the garage and uh, spread from there and spread to the adjacent structure. These two homes are almost connected by a wooden uh, elevated driveway platform. And so the fire was able to start it in a garage and just basically traveled across to the next house. Most of the damage was confined to the elevated parking deck structures and carports and some of the area below, but, but the homes themselves, the dwellings were pretty much spared. Which was good news. Yeah. But uh, anyhow. And Martin's is pretty pretty narrow. Yeah. 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 That'd be a hard one. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? One thing with that, that uh, everybody should have received a save a date for September 20th uh, batch meeting ceremony. Just to make sure. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's going to be at the Elks. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm the mediator for the Elks. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Hosted, well, we're hosted yeah. by Commissioner Waterbury. Yeah, I got, that's, yeah. That, yeah. That, that should be on the invitation. Yeah. It should be. Yes. Yeah, and my wife is the manager there. Is she yeah. the manager there? I, mean, I know she's working. Wow. The Elks get in so much trouble, they need a mediator? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's a drinking place. It's yeah. a rough bunch. If there is no further business, then at uh, 5.3 uh, or thereabouts. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.